Amen, amen. God bless you, family. God, welcome to the Blaze Bible Study. It's your brother, DJ Sam Rock, and we're here on the Blaze Bible Study every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I want to thank you for listening. I want to thank you for stopping by. And if this is your first time listening to the Blaze podcast, the Blaze Bible Study, we're basically here for 20 to 25 to 30 minutes getting into the Word of God. And what basically I do is God will, you know, inspire me to go into a certain area, a certain topic, what I'm facing in life, what I think a lot more people uh, are facing in life. And I'll go into the word and see what God's word has to say about it. I know there's a lot of people who don't necessarily care about what the word of God has to say over their lives and in their lives, and they don't find it, find any value. But I also understand there are people that are searching uh, for the truth and truth by definition is exclusive. And all I'm saying is all I know is that once in 2001, in December 12, I called upon an invisible God because I had no trust in him. I had no belief in him, truly any belief in him. And I wanted a change in my life. What happened? Well, I called upon this Jesus, this God, and I asked him to change me. And not only just change me, simply change me, but I'm talking about change me by the next day that I woke up and I told God if I wasn't going to feel a change or I wasn't changing by the next day that I woke up, then I wasn't going to trust and believe that there's any God and I'm going to keep it moving. And that's my testimony. The next day I woke up, I don't know exactly how to explain it, but all I can say is that, you know, when your eyes open up and, you know, a new day is bright in the morning or whatever, only thing I knew, know is when my eyes opened up, not only did my eyes open, but I felt something inside of me awaken. I felt something inside of me open up and uh, awaken. And later on, I found out to be the transformational power of calling on God um, wholeheartedly, trusting and believing that he could change a life. And that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. And really, there's really nothing else to say about it other than God is good. But let's see, I'm going to go back into, you know, this Bible studies in a, in a way of really saying goodbye. And what I mean by that, uh, I heard from the Lord through prayer and fasting, and he told me, and a lot of people will say, well, I never heard God's voice. I never heard him audibly, but I do hear him audibly. And a lot more people also hear him audibly. It's a spirit thing. I hear, I heard him inside my head. How do I know it's God's voice? You might ask, well, let's pray. And then I'm going to explain to you how I, me, DJ Sandrock, the guy who does the Bible studies, I was an enemy of God. Me, I was an enemy of God. I was God's enemy. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the opportunity that you've given me today to express your word to your people, to your creation, to all those who called upon your name and those who are, have yet to call upon your name to be saved. I pray for all of us, Lord God, that we would receive what you are saying, what you're doing, the move of God, the power of God, the authority that you have through your word and through the power of your Holy Spirit, which is you again in the third person. I pray, Lord God, that you would touch, bless, speak, teach, and re-invigorate um, and give a resurrection and a, a renewing to the mind of every single listener and every single person that comes to visit the Blaze Bible Study. I pray this in no other name, but in the name of Jesus Christ, my Lord and my Savior. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. And um, basically what I'm saying is this. Uh, God is good. And because he's good, there's no reason why uh, I should have been his enemy. If God is good, right, why would I be his enemy? And it's just one of those things that you're like, okay, if someone is good to you, why would you be bad to them? You know, that type of thing. And since I didn't know who God was and I didn't really believe, I heard the story about Jesus. I heard the story about God. I heard, um, you know, so many people testify of his goodness, his greatness, his awesome power, but I couldn't make the connection with me. I couldn't make the connection. You know, I didn't have an issue um, with really God himself. I had an issue with God's people because I thought they were lying to me because it was like almost you ever heard a story that sounds too good to be true and so simple to get 
this goodness, so simple to get into a relationship with this guy that everybody was talking about. It was too simple for me. I thought there had to be some kind of change before you approach God. I thought I had to be some kind of saint before I even mentioned Jesus. I thought I had to be, you know, dressed a certain way. I had to speak a certain way. I had to um, live a certain way. I had to eat a certain way. I thought all these rules had to happen in my life before I dared ever approach a holy God, right? And a lot of people listening right now, you're thinking that right now. You're like, well, it's cool for you, man, but I you know, I don't want to be a hypocrite. I don't want to go to church because then I'm not going to be a hypocrite. I'm not going to be able to do it this, that, and the third. I'm raising my hand if you can only see me because I was the same way. And being the same way means that basically um, we're all in the same boat. There's really nobody um, better, nobody lesser. Um, than anyone, whether you're a Christian or not. We're all human beings. We're all created in the image of God. We're all image bearers of God. And a lot of people say, well, there is no God, so therefore I'm not created in any image but the image of my parents. Well, then, you know, the argument with would be who created your parents and then who created your parents' parents and who created your parents' parents' parents. And it all goes down like a regression all the way to the beginning. There had to be some first cause, some first um, being some first creator. It had to be. There's nothing that came out of nothing. Nothing out of nothing is nothing. But I believe that someone created everything out of nothing. And to me, that makes more sense. But let me just take it like this. I was God's enemy. And a lot of people listening right now, you can't say you was because you are right now. You might be saying, well, I'm a good person. And I'm going to have to tell you and question that goodness, you know, There's three questions I always ask when somebody says, hey, I'm a good person. I don't need God. I could be good without God. I don't need God to be good. And I would always ask these three questions. Have you ever told a lie? And if they're honest, they would say, yeah, I've told lots of lies. And also, have you ever stolen anything? And if they're honest again, they would say, yeah, I've stolen something. And I would also ask, hey, did you ever look and anyone with less than your heart after that person. And some people would say no because they say, no, I'm married. You know, I don't do that anymore. Or some people would just say, yeah, I'll, everybody does that. So out of those three things that people admit that they do, those are three commandments out of the 10 popular commandments that we speak of, the 10 commandments that they have broken. And I simply asked them, hey, we just went through three of God's 10 commandments we, we both, me and the person I'm speaking to, we both broke these laws. If you died today, right, and you had to face a holy God that you say is not there, but you face him, where would he send you? What do you think the judgment would be, heaven or hell? And then that starts another discussion. Well, I don't believe in heaven. I don't believe in heaven. You know, whatever the case may be, it brings a question to the conscience. And it brings us to realize, hey, man, I might not be all cracked up when I said I am. And to be good... It's a big task. I truly believe that you cannot be good unless you have the one that's good inside of you living it out, living it out through you. That's just, you know, um, the way I believe, because I know for sure I'm not a good person without God. With God, I'm struggling. But the good God in me, Holy Spirit God in me is good. He's perfect. He's the comforter. He's the one who gives you the power. He's the one who gives you to um, lead you into all understanding of his word. He reminds you of what the word of God has spoken into your life and over your life. He, the Holy Spirit, will do those things in your life. We just have to learn how to listen. We just have to learn how to listen. And, you know, honestly, like this is a, this is about honesty. A lot of people have arguments and um, they have degrees of, you know, this degree and that degree. They go to school and, you know, they have all these um, one-liners of how God doesn't exist and this, that, and the third but when it comes down to the conscience and honest honesty, you have to deal with that. I have to deal with that on a day-to-day basis because I can learn a million things about God. I can learn a million things against God. And, you know, at the end of the day, it won't matter because I have to still deal with the conscience that I have inside of me. God has play, written the law. The law of God is written on everyone's heart, the Bible says. And whether you believe it or not, like say somebody didn't believe in gravity and they jumped off the roof of the Empire State Building, right? And they're going and they say, I don't believe in gravity. I don't believe in gravity. What do you think is going to happen to that person when they hit the ground? 
Just because you don't believe in something doesn't mean that there's not a consequence for not believing in something. God is good, but he is not safe. God is good in terms of everything that he has done, the sacrifice he has made. He's not a dictator. He doesn't force anyone to believe in him. He doesn't force anyone to follow him. He doesn't force anyone to be a Christian. He doesn't force anybody to go to church. He doesn't force anybody to tithe. He doesn't force anybody to give to the needy. He doesn't force anybody to dress a certain way, to speak a certain way. God does not force us to do anything. As a matter of fact, the Bible says all things are permissible, but all things are not profitable. In other words, all th- you could do all things, you could do anything you want, but not everything is going to be beneficial to you and to me. And that's the, the punchline of the whole <laughs> thing about being a Christian. You're not forced to be a Christian. Now, I know there's some um, religious establishments, organized religions um, that force you to do this, that, and the third just to be a part of their group, to be a part of their church, to be a part of their community. But when you look at the scriptures, this thing is all an inside job. If God doesn't transform your life, if God doesn't enter your life by way of his Holy Spirit, which is him again in the third person, then it's not going to be any change. You're not going to want to go to church. You're not going to want to do good things. You're not going to want to do right. You're not going to want to know truth. You're not going to know how to love because God is love in essence. You're not going to want to do anything. But it brings me back to the original statement. I was an enemy of God. Now, how do I know that? Well, let's look at the scripture that I was looking at earlier. It's found in Colossians chapter 1, verse 21. Colossians chapter 1, verse 21 says it like this. This includes you. And when I say you, I'm pointing the finger at me. This includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies separated from him. And now this is where people add stuff. Yeah, I'm separated from God because, um, you know, the devil. I'm separated from God because, you know, my old pastor was evil. I'm separated from God. This is where people put all kind of fillers in here. But the word says you were his enemy separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. By whose evil thoughts and actions? This verse blows me away. And God is saying by your evil thoughts and actions. Obviously, God is not evil. Obviously, God is good. So it wasn't his thoughts and actions that separated me from him. It was my thoughts and actions that separated me from a holy God. And that's an amazing thing. So my question to you tonight is, have you ever thought of yourself as God's enemy? Have you ever literally thought of yourself as God's enemy? Because if you can say, no, I'm not God's enemy, that must mean that you're uh a believer. It must mean that you are trusting in the living God. Now, which God? You know, Christians, I'm a Christian. I claim and I believe that Yahweh, right? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Yahweh, the God, which um, centuries after, right, uh, the prophecies of Jesus coming, I believe that Jesus Christ, Yeshua, was Yahweh God in the form of a man. That's what a Christian believes. And a Christian will also tell you this, because I'm a Christian and I know that he lived among us for 33 and a half years, right? And he died. It was buried on a, in, in, a, in a tomb. And on the third day, he rose again. And the Bible says that he promises he's coming back. And people call that the second coming. I call it the, th- the third coming because I truly believe Jesus was with us since we known about our time of history, our uh, time. God sits outside of time, so he doesn't have a beginning. He doesn't have an end. But when it comes to like natural time, you know, the time that we think of in the calendar, I believe he was always, has always been. There's never been a time when Jesus has not been. So in other words, he didn't, he was never dead and come to life except for the resurrection power of the Holy Spirit, which He fulfilled the prophecy on the cross, got crucified, died, was buried, and three days later rose again. And is still alive to to today, and he is coming back according to the scriptures. So being born again is very, very important. Because if you're not, Jesus said to the religious leader of his time, Nicodemus, at night in John chapter 3, I believe it was, you must be born again to inherit the kingdom of God. And I hope I'm, I'm quoting the right scripture in John. Um, so you must be born again to even see the kingdom of God, to inherit the kingdom of God, Jesus told Nicodemus. 
we call it Nick at night because Nicodemus was a religious leader and he did not want to be seen talking to Jesus, Yeshua, right? Uh, in front of his peers. Other words, in other words, he was kind of like hiding out, kind of like had a feeling that this rabbi was the real deal, but he didn't want to be questioned by his peers um, later on and say, hey, were you talking to Jesus? What were you talk talking about? He didn't want to go through that. And a lot of people right now are the same way. They don't want to go through that with their friends. They don't want to go through that with their families. So they'd rather stay an enemy of God to join up all the other enemies of God because, you know, hey, people like company, right? So if it's the easiest thing to say there's, there's no God, you know, uh, it's popular right now. There is no God. And this is not a Christian uh, nation, which I agree. This is a nation um, that took um, principles from scripture and created a nation with value and gave honor to Yahweh God because it does say God through Jesus Christ in the Constitution and in you know all the writings of the forefathers. But is this a Christian nation now? Obviously not. And rightfully so. This is not a the theocracy. This is not a, a nation that um, has to be one religion. You know, everyone comes here from all different backgrounds, from every different religion. They all come to the United States of America and they should have freedom to express what they want to say, what they want to believe. So it's not my job to really force anybody to become a Christian. It's not even my job to um, make people believe. That is the job of the Holy Spirit. God is the God. He's God, right? So he doesn't really need anyone to convince anyone else that he exists. The Holy Spirit of God will do the convincing. As a matter of fact, when you look up at the stars, the sky, the moon, if you're really honest with yourself, you'd be like, man, that is an incredible sight to see. Someone had to be um, the handwriter of all this. Someone had to be thought of all of this. Someone had to be a reason of all of this. And then, you know, some people say, well, no, nah, it was just a bunch of molecules and atoms that exploded, the Big Bang Theory, and we evolved from this, that, to the third. We, Our ancestors are monkeys, and we're primates, and this, that, and the third. And it sounds kind of like weird to me sometimes, but I understand why people would believe that. It's, um, um, it's a human thing to believe. <laughs> why wouldn't someone believe that way? Um, and what the miracle is, in my estimation, is how I believed in God. I think that's a miracle right there that I, Sam, believed in a holy God and actually called out to him when I was drunk and high one day in my house, my first house. And yeah, and he heard me. That right there is miraculous. Not only did he hear me, but he changed me. That right there is miraculous to change a person from the way I was to the way I am now and knowing and trusting in the promises of God over my life to bring me to the place where he's promised to meet me at. This is, is an amazing thing. I can't convince nobody else about Jesus being who he says he is. I leave that to Jesus, God, Holy Spirit. I leave that to the three in one, Yahweh God. That God will really explain that to a person who's really seeking after him wholeheartedly. Now, how many people are looking for truth? How many people are honestly searching out for truth? You know, if I did a, a survey right now and there was 100 people in the room and if I asked, hey, how many people are seeking truth? And then some people probably raise their hand. How many people are looking for truth through God? And there would probably be less people. Why? Maybe it could be peer pressure. Maybe it could be just the audience. Maybe it could be just, you know, the time that I'm saying it, you know, what year I'm saying it in, because it seems like every year that passes, um, we're growing less and less or we're growing far and far away from this message that we call the gospel message, the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not saying everybody because I don't know everybody. I'm not saying uh, the majority because I don't know the majority. And as a matter of fact, even if I did a study and I knew the numbers, I can't say because X amount of people in India b believe in, in something different than me. That means that every time I go to India, I'm going to bump into a person that doesn't believe in Christianity. I can't say that. That's really being arrogant. 
That's me saying that I know all people are everywhere. And just because the number says, you know, 10 million people uh, believe in this and 1 million per- people believe in that. Uh, I'm like, I can't just go to uh, another country thinking that, OK, because the majority rules here, I'm not going to find nobody that believes in Jesus. Uh, as a matter of fact, I follow a man in the ministry that he is from India <laughs> And India has millions of deities that they could believe in. And somehow, some way, he was presented with the gospel message of John, the book of John, I think is chapter 14, and where Jesus said, I live, so therefore you shall live. I'm paraphrasing. And that on his deathbed as a teenager and an Indian, and he was in a high caste system, and his family was well-to-do, his dad was a well-to-do man, and he was struggling academically, so it led him to try to take his own life as a teenager, and someone shows up to his hospital bed with a, with the Bible, and with the book of John open, and gives him John 14, and that one verse, that one scripture, brought this man, this young man, this teenager at the time, to a reality of truth. He said, if that's true, I'm not going to leave any stone unturned until I seek this out for what it really is. And if Jesus is exactly who he says he is in the scriptures and you believe him, there's really no reason to, for you to fear. As a matter of fact, the Bible says when the promised Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be his witnesses all around the world. Why? Because then we'll have a transformed, renewed mind. We won't have to rely on. On every Sunday, Wednesday, Tuesday, or whatever time you go to services, we want to just have to rely on the word that's being preached from the pulpits all over the world. We can rely on the inner Holy Spirit of God that lives within us to bring us into all truth. And that's another miracle of God who lives in us, the hope of glory. So what do you think? Are you an enemy of God? And this is where you just be honest with yourself and answer yes or no. If you're not sure... Or if you're saying it doesn't matter because there is no God, well, then let's just put it like this. This should be yes, no. Uh, Really, maybe doesn't make any sense because maybe what? Maybe your enemy is either you're an enemy or not. It's either heaven or hell. It's either yes or no. It's either I believe or I don't. You know, it's really black and white. I know it sounds fancy. It sounds like, like you're intelligent because... You know how to make words blend and sound really important for giving your reasons why you believe or the reasons why you don't believe. Therefore, you know, I leave that to the scholars. They want to argue. They want to have debates as long as it's something that ends up fruitful and somebody's helped in the in the process. I'm all for it. But for people like me that, you know, we just want to have a, a basic understanding of life because we might be struggling financially, we might be struggling with our health, we might be struggling relationally. I just want to know what's the truth. Now, I don't want really people's opinions. So if, you, if you're like me and you don't want opinions, you could literally, and this is the amazing thing about God and the gospel and his word, you could literally pick up a Bible right now and look at it for yourself. Literally, like the invitation is open to whosoever calls on the name of of the Lord shall be saved. This is an amazing world view. The only world view, and you can look it up, that has a redemptive message, meaning that we messed up, human beings, we messed up, we fell, got kicked out of a perfect environment that God had created for us in the beginning, and then closed that door because the Garden Eden Garden of Eden is guarded by an angel with fire, you know. And we can't go back in there. But he created a system of redemption, meaning that he's going to fix what we messed up and we're gonna he's going to pay what we owe and what we could not afford to pay anyway. And he did that through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amazing story. You have to look at it for yourself. The book of John, right? Um all the all the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then you look at the book of Acts. Then you go into Romans. You know, you look at the scriptures. It has historical proof, right? It's historical places that are mentioned in the scriptures. You can actually go to right now that exist. The places that do not exist are the places that God says he destroyed. uh, That he said he destroyed. So you won't find it anymore on the map. 
Um, this is an amazing, amazing historical book called the Bible. It has history. It has poetry. It has uh, books of wisdom. It has prophecies that to the detail have been fulfilled. Like to the very day, minute, time that the prophet had said something was going to happen, they've come to pass. Now, a book with that much backing and that much scrutiny, because people have, you had thousands of years out there, all you naysayers, you had thousands of years to find errors and to find that this is all a hoax and fantasy. You had thousands of years to prove it, yet the scriptures are still standing. Why? Because the word of God says that everything is going to pass away, but the word of God will remain. You know, everybody has this idea and concept. Some people even think that um, some aliens came down here and planted pods or seeds on the earth, and then they created everything. They left, and then by the time human beings were um, creative and intelligent enough to figure out what they have done down here with the pyramids and all that. Then we started writing scriptures and we copied off what was already written on the, you know, walls and on the pyramids and all that stuff. And, and that's how we came up with this God and with this Bible and all that stuff. It sounds like a movie, a science fiction movie, but you know, people believe stuff like that. So all I could do is respect it. You know, I don't have to go through that. I'm a science fiction fan too. Um, but to believe that, um, aliens came and, and did this, that, and the third, and left. And then when we were intelligent enough to start figuring things out, we wrote a book called the Bible, and we created all this um, stuff in the Bible. We even created the prophecies that came true. Um, that's really giving credit too much to our uh, human power, because if I prophesy something and it doesn't come to pass, you could really look at me and say, I'm wrong, I'm crazy, and, and I'm you know, just wacko. But if there's a prophecy that I prophesied, maybe out of the scripture, or God gives me exclusive for someone and it comes to pass, then you have to really start thinking about this in a different way, other than aliens and other than, you know, people flying out from, you know, different planets to our planet. And you might start wondering, hey, is this thing good? But the question still remains, are you an enemy of what's good? Are you an enemy of God? Me, Sam, Sam Rock, DJ, I was an enemy of God. Not really, not really standing up and getting up one day and say, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be an enemy of God. Circumstances just lined up to a way where I could just don't like him or don't follow him or don't obey him because, you know, my dad died when I was 15 years old. So I took it as, hey, if there's a God, why would he, do, if there was a God, why would he take my dad at 43 years old? I needed him for, you know, some time. I was a young man growing up. I didn't, I needed my dad. So I became angry and I, you know, put an anger out for God, on God. And I said, yeah, he, he did this to me. So I'm, I'm angry with him. So I'm not really gonna, you know, follow him like that. I'm not gonna trust him like that. I'm not gonna obey him like that. So you know, I'll skip it for now. And that's that's the way I was thinking at the time. You know, you might have a different reason why um, you don't believe God, but that was my reason because I really thought that he took something from me that I needed in my future. So now what I was going to do, you know, I was like, okay, so I got shortchanged here. Like <laughs> everybody else's dad is alive, you know, you know, stuff like that. That's the way I was thinking as a 15 year old young man. So I got angry, got into a lot of fights, got into sex, drugs, and alcohol, all the way till I was 30 years old, until I came to the bottom uh, half of my life. In other words, I was rock bottom, and I said, well, okay, I've done a lot of stuff. It didn't get me the promises that the world said I would have, you know, fame, money, and all that stuff. Fast cars, fast women didn't do it, right? So I was like, okay, there has to be something else. So that's that's why I drunk and high in the year 2001. I called upon this God that everybody was telling me about, these Christians, these Mormons, these Muslims. All these people were talking about this God, this power that could change me. So I called upon that power, whoever he was, to change me. And he did. And that was December 12, 2001. And all the way till today, to the time of this podcast, I've never turned back because there's nothing. there was nothing to turn back to. I did it all kind of like did a lot of things that were 
supposed to promise me this, that, and a third, and it all left me emptier than ever. So the question remains, are you God's enemy? I know I was once God's enemy, but what happened? I called him out and said, hey, come and change me. If you can't change me, then fine. There is no God, just like I thought. But if you call upon God and he starts changing you, then you need to investigate who is actually changing you and who are you actually an enemy of. I hope you got something out of this. The scripture again was Colossians chapter 1 verse 21. Check it out for yourself. Read the whole chapter, Colossians chapter 1, and I hope you're blessed. God bless you. God keep you. And remember, God is good. Peace.